Thank you, Christy. Can everyone hear me? Because I really hate roaming mics. But you know, brats. <laughs> can anyone hear me? Because I will sacrifice and carry a mic around if I have to. Speak like this loud the entire time. You guys are going to be all right? <laughs> Just checking. All right. A few things I have to warn you about. The first one is I'm from America. You'll get over it. And it'll be all right. <laughs> um, the second is I'm kind of a jello American, which means I pick up on accents. So like if all of a sudden in the middle I start sounding like I'm from Australia, it's because I've been hanging around Matt Frad too much. <laughs> and, then, and then if I start sounding like you guys, it's because I've been hanging around my roommates too much. So, And then um, the third thing would be, um, we're going to be very honest here from the front. I'm actually not Catholic, and uh, I was scared to tell everybody that. <laughs> They're going to kick me. Thank you. They're going to kick me out. But um, it has been such an, a blessing to be here. What a few days, huh? It feels like it's been. It just been. It's been amazing, and like I feel so blessed. And I told Tara when we were talking last night. I said it feels like I found a long lost family. Like. I found all of these brothers and sisters I didn't even know I have, so it's really exciting. Um, but today we're kind of going to talk about um, some pretty rough stuff. And uh, how many of you actually knew what this workshop was about when you signed up for it? Oh, you're brave. <laughs> Everyone else is like, whoa, women's workshop, we're going to that. So, <laughs> so you all are in for a surprise here, huh? <laughs> um, today we're actually going to talk about lust. And I know that's like, oh! And all the men that I have told are like, um, that's a men's workshop topic. <laughs> Thank you. I know. <laughs> um, but about six years ago, almost to the date, I was in Bible college, and I was in a, a meeting like this, but the room was a lot bigger. <laughs> there was a lot more room, and there were more of us. There was about 300 of us. And the dean of women got up to the front, and she started talking about this thing called strongholds. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 10. And it says that, um, that our warfare is spiritual, not physical, and that our weapons are spiritual, and that they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so it got into this topic of what is a stronghold, because obviously it's a bad thing. You know, if we're pulling them down with God's power, then a stronghold would be a bad thing. Um, and a stronghold is, a good definition would be, it is a place the enemy takes up behind your own front lines. So if any of that was American, let me try to like <laughs> explain it in Canadian. Um, <laughs> when you're in a battle, you're always focused on what's in front of you. Like, you never really see soldiers watching their back. Like, they assume that anything behind them, they've conquered, they're over it, and they're better now. And so they're always battling what's in front of them. But a stronghold would be like this. Like, if there is a castle in a town where a king and all of his court resides, and all these soldiers come traipsing through and conquer the entire village, burn it down, but leave the castle with the king and all of his court there, and then keep waltzing on like... You know, like they won. And here's this castle with this court and all these bad guys right behind them ready to get them. And so a stronghold isn't so much something that we're presently dealing with. It's something that we thought we were over, that we're not actively struggling with, that's messing with our lives. It's the way the devil kind of puts a hook in your back, I like to say. And so you're walking forward for God. And that's what you guys are all here for. And it's been, like, absolutely crazy to watch you guys go forward for like renewment and then to go forward for missions like you have no idea what it's like to stand back and be like what like god is here and he is working and then some of you are going to find that like when tomorrow happens and you all go home that it's like god like forgot where you were <laughs> like he doesn't follow you there sometimes and it feels like okay i'm ready here we go january 1st 2011 new year and it's almost like have you ever seen like commercials where there's a glass wall there, you know, and the idiots walking down and pushed right into the wall. That's what it feels like in our spiritual walk. Like we're walking for God, walking for God, and all of a sudden, we can't go anywhere. I'm like, but I want to. And like I went to rise up, and I had this spiritual experience. And like I went for it, and I went to prayer, and I've done confession. Like I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Why isn't this working? And that's a stronghold. There's a presence of a stronghold in our lives. And so the dean of women at this meeting stood up. And she said, we know that some of you have a stronghold. We are coming into a new year just like you guys are. I mean, you're spending New Year's Eve with me. You guys are so sweet. <laughs> we were coming right into a new year. And everyone, you know, you always look at January 1st. It's like, this is it. Like, this is the year that I, whatever. <laughs> Fill in the blank. And so we were having that kind of experience. And she was wanting us to really break through and, like, 
really find our walk with God. And she says, some of you have this stronghold. You struggle with pornography and masturbation. And like the whole room went dead. Kind of like just a no. <laughs> the whole room went completely silent. There were 300 young women in that room, Christian young women, just like you guys are all Christian young women. It wasn't like the middle of a mall street evangelizing. Like This was a Christian college. It was a Bible college. Like The women here are wanting to grow closer to God. That's why they came. And she's standing up there saying that there are women, plural, in this room who struggle with these things. You never hear that. And in that moment, I felt like I was the only person that they were talking to. Like, there's a, a room full of women around me, my friends, and they're only talking to me. And <laughs> here it is. My name is Jessica Harris, and I used to be a porn addict. Now, how do you <laughs> start that conversation in the church? You know, hi, I'm Jessica, and yeah, I'm addicted to porn. <laughs> Have a nice day. Bye. <laughs> um, and I never really knew how to start the conversation. And on top of that, I didn't really understand how I had gotten to this point that I had to even have that conversation. Like, no little girl wakes up one day and is like, I know what I'm going to do today. 2011 is going to be the year that I get addicted to lust. Yep, top of the top of the list. That's it. No one does that. Like, we all are princesses when we're little, you know? And we like to dress up. We still do. You guys are all really dressed up tonight. I have a floor-length gown. I'm all excited. But that's who we are when we're little. We're not like, oh, yes, please make me a sex object. Me. Pick me. We don't do that. Oh, yes, I'd like to struggle with lust this year. Please, God, help me do that. We don't, we don't choose that. You know, we don't grow up, oh, I really wish I could struggle. Well, I can't wait until the day that I can struggle with this. Like, and so what got me to that point. How on earth did I get to the point where I was the person they were talking to and not the person like, oh, really? Like, I'm going, oh, really? Oh, that's me. <laughs> Whoops. So we can blame it on a lot of things, and modern psychology does. We could blame it on my dad. He left my family when I was seven, and I was a daddy's girl. So I remember very well the day that I was at piano lessons and he never came to get me. And it was right around Christmas time. And I remember the Christmas tree and my piano teacher practicing the Christmas song. And I'm like looking out the frosted window, like in a movie, looking out the frosted window and dad's not coming. And for hours I remember sitting there and my mom finally came to get me. She's freaking out because like he's got to be dead. You know, got to be a horrific accident somewhere and he's dead. And we get to the house and he cleaned everything out of the house and just left. I hadn't told anybody. And so it broke my heart because it was like he took my heart with him but never brought it back. And so I began to really struggle with what's love then? Like your father's supposed to love you unconditionally and here's what my dad did to me. So what, what must love be then? It's got to be something you earn, something you keep, and then something you obviously can lose because I apparently lost it. And so I began to really develop twisted views of love, and that's honestly at the root of everything, that's what lust is for women, it's just a twisted view of love. But So we could blame it on my dad, or we could blame it on the little boy when I was nine, we were riding home on the bus together, and he looks over and he says, take your clothes off. Nine, okay, or younger. Um, and I was like, excuse me? <laughs> you want to run that by me again? We were on a school bus, okay? Like the bus is going to the oratory school bus, okay? There were people on the school bus, and I'm like, you're, and I'm by the window, and you want me to what? And, but how do you start that conversation as a nine-year-old? Like, so Jessica, how was your day at school today? Yeah, well, Mom, see, the boy on the bus asked me to take off my clothes for him. You know, like, you don't start that conversation either. But I wanted affection so much, and he was my only friend. So I did, on a school bus, full of people, by the window seat, on the way home from school, and it began to develop this thought process in me that this is what's expected of us in order to be accepted. That this is a sacrifice we have to make in order to be loved. This is it. Like, and so between 9 and 13, I don't really remember much, but I do remember that somewhere in there, I developed a very clear understanding of sexuality. Like I knew what it was. I got it. Maybe not got it, got it, but I understood. And Somewhere in there I began to masturbate. I couldn't even tell you how. I don't know when that started. I don't know how it started. I don't remember. But I will never forget the day that I was exposed to pornography. And the choices that I made 
We're talking about all these people we can blame for what happened to me and why I did what I did. But the choices I made from that day on were no one else's but mine. Like, there's no one else to blame. No one made me do this. No one forced this on me. This is my choice. And so I had gotten myself to the place that I had to stand up and be like, yeah, I'm one of those women that struggle with this. Like, I hated it. I wasn't, like, proud of it or anything. And it started for me as much of a curiosity because I was looking for acceptance a lot. You know, I was getting made fun of for <laughs> being fat. I haven't lost weight since high school, just so everyone knows. I was getting made fun of for being fat. I was getting made fun of for being ugly. I was getting made fun of for being a virgin, and I was 11 when I got made fun of for being a virgin. And so, yeah. <laughs> what? Um, so I kind of looked at pornography as like, okay, maybe acceptance is in here somewhere, because I hadn't found it anywhere else. I was a straight-A student, and no one cared. I was a good church girl, and no one cared. I was a perfect daughter, maybe not, but no one cared. And so I thought, maybe there's acceptance in here. So it started as a curiosity. And at 13, it was too strong. You know, like, pornography is intense stuff. Like, it's, it's gross. And, like, it offends your conscience because God wants it to do that. Um, but it led me into sex chatting, which probably isn't as popular today. Sexting is probably the new sex chatting, but it led me into that, and I felt so good because somebody finally loved me for me, even though I wasn't me. Like in a chat room, I wasn't like, yes, my name is Jessica, and I'm 5'8", and I have a lot of freckles and brown crazy hair and brown eyes. Like I was like, oh, yeah, my name's Angela, and I'm 5'10", and tan, and blonde, and 23, you know, <laughs> and I'm none of those things. But it made me feel accepted and it made me feel loved and cherished and so it was a curiosity and then it kind of grew into an interest then it became what are they talking about in this chat with me I need to figure it out so it almost became like a research project like what is that I have to go Google it you know but don't Google that because it's bad but like I would have to kind of be like oh, what's he talking about and like they needed me to know in order to love me so I have to go and have to research this so it became an interest, and it still wasn't really something I wanted to do, but I just wanted that connection with people, okay? Even though it's like I never saw them, it's just text on a screen, and it changes every single day. I wanted that connection, and so I would research. And then it started turning into a hobby, where it was like, you know, yeah, it's kind of fun. Like, it's fun to do this, you know, and I started to kind of pencil in time into my day, okay, I'm going to go home, I'm going to do my homework, and then mom gets home at 5, so I have from 3.30 to 5 o'clock, and what am I going to do today? Like, I was planning it out, but I still felt like I was very much in control, like I was choosing to do this, like I was very much in control of my sexuality, thank you very much. And, but then it started to develop into an addiction, and it got to the point, within three years of my first exposure, it got to the point where I understood that I was addicted to this. And I could not go a day without participating in some way in lust. I could not go a day without looking at pornography. I could not go a day without fantasizing. I could not go a day without master. Like it, one of the one of them, and it, every single day, it became like the air I breathe. And if I didn't do it, my day was not complete. Like nothing else mattered. And so it started becoming something I hated because I was supposed to be in control of my life and I was no longer in control of my life. It was screwing up my life. It was keeping me up late at night and I was failing my classes. I am a straight A student. Straight A students don't fail their classes. And so I began to be very angry and kind of want to put it back in its box. I don't know, like think of like a wild dog, I guess, you know. Like, oh, it's a cute puppy when it's in its cage, you let it out and it pees on your furniture and chews up your pillows and then it's like, get back in your cage. That's what it felt like. And I felt like I completely had lost control and I needed to just shove it back in its cage. Like it was fine to be in my life, but it needed to be contained. And so I began to like print off pictures and burn them. <laughs> like literally, I would take a match and light them and put them in the sink and just watch them burn. And kind of like have this whole feeling of, ha ha, like what now? <laughs> and I felt like I was in control. I would print off, I would save them to the floppy disks. I just dated myself. How many of you don't know what a floppy disk is? Good. <laughs> I would save them to floppy disks and then I would shatter the outside and it has that little silver ring on the inside. I would take a magnet, run it across that, take scissors, chop it up, and throw it in the trash can. Ha! 
like, I'm in control of this. I wanted to be in control. But nothing was working, because if you think about it like a castle, oh goodness, think about like St. Joseph's Oratory, that thing is huge, okay? And imagine like you're gonna like launch an assault against St. Joseph's Oratory for some reason. And you go up and you pick out this cute little pebble and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's what it's like to try and break this in your own power, to try to break pornography in your own power, to break less in your own power, it's just like picking up little pebbles and throwing them at St. Joseph's Oratory and hoping that one day just falls over. And so I was doing it all, though, without God because I did not want anything to do with God at that point. People were promoting God as a Heavenly Father, and I was like, listen, you don't know what my Father did to me, and the last thing I need is an almighty, all-powerful God to like send all of his wrath down on me. No, thank you. Like I will take my chances. But when I was 17, I came to know Christ. And I would love to be able to say the end and the relief. Like, but it didn't get any easier. Like it actually got harder. And for the first time I understood that this wasn't a physical battle. It wasn't me versus my body and me versus my desires. Like this was like me withstanding hell. Like it kind of takes on a little more serious note when you involve hell. Like, this was darkness and, like, those powers of darkness after my life and after my mind and after my heart. And that scared the crap out of me. But I was like, now what? So you get online. You're like, okay, there's got to be something. Google, women struggling with pornography. Nothing. Okay. Um, Christians struggling with pornography. And everything that popped up was for men. Everything. Men's resources don't work for women because we struggle with lust differently than men do. And so they're really bad to read, actually. If you're struggling with lust, don't read them because it doesn't help. And I began to feel really messed up, like really messed up. Like, okay, so I am apparently the only woman on the face of the planet Earth that got herself into this mess. <laughs> oh, good job, Jessica. Like everything else was for like women having sex, and I hadn't done that yet because I knew that was wrong. That's bad. You know, we don't do that. We can apparently just do everything but that. And I had developed this thought of, as long as I'm a virgin, who do you go to? Like, if no one's talking about it, which pastor's wife do I decide to completely freak out? You know, <laughs> which one do I want to die of a heart attack? <laughs> so I just began to pray, God, help me get caught so that it's someone else is saying, Jessica, did you do this? And I can say, yes. And we'll be done. Like, it'll be over, and everyone will know, and we can start working from there. And I went off to Christian college, and I got caught. I did. Two months after college, I got a summons to the dean's office, and half of me was like, yes! And the other half of me was like, crap. And so I went, and I sat across from this dean of women, and there was a folder on the desk, probably about this thick, of papers, full of internet addresses. She opens it up, and they were, the computer had flagged bad websites, and then they had gone through and highlighted the ones that were obviously bad, like, you didn't, like, there was no way out of this by saying, oh, well, it stands for, like, no. And she looks at this, and she's like, this is disgusting. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, I know. But I didn't say anything. I'm just sitting there listening to her. This is gross. This is disgusting. I don't need to see this. My staff doesn't need to see this. You don't need to see this. So she closes the cover, screws the folder off to the side, pulls out a piece of paper, and says, that being said, we know this wasn't you. Oh, really? <laughs> pretty funny, because I'm pretty sure it was me. Um, but she's like, women just don't struggle with us. Like, women don't have this problem. And it's like, whoever has this problem needs major help. So you need to stop giving your password out to your brothers in Christ. You need to protect them. It's wrong of you to do this. Change your password. Sign the paper. If it happens again, you're going home. Okay. <laughs> there was never, was this you? Nothing. And so I walked back to my dorm room, and I felt so screwed up. Like, and I seriously said to God, you saved the wrong girl. Like, there's got to be some other Jessica Harris that you meant to save because you can't save this one, apparently. Like, I wanted to love God, and I wanted to be loved by God, but apparently I wasn't allowed <laughs> to struggle. Apparently this was, like, so bad that, like, I just wasn't even human anymore. Like, I was some twisted version of humanity. And so I began to give up, and I thought, you know what? What's the point? What's the point of living a life where I'm covering my tracks, where I'm putting on face of, yes, I'm the good Christian college student. Oh, I'm going to be a doctor someday when I grow up. Oh, I'm the good, you know, I'm saving myself for marriage. What's the point of playing all of these cards when none of it's real? So why don't I just give up? 
And I didn't want to give up, but I didn't know what else to do. And so I started this online conversation with a man, and for the first time, I identified myself for who I was to him. I began to connect my real life to the fake one I had been living. And I told him my real name. I showed him my real picture. I gave him my real phone number. I gave him my real address. I put everybody in my dorm at complete and total risk and really didn't care. And girls do that nowadays and they get kidnapped and like killed. And only by the grace of God did I not get kidnapped and killed. But we started to chat because I was not stupid enough to go online and look at pictures again because then my mom would have to know and like she would die. So I would just sex chat now. Like it, it was, I was getting to the point where I really didn't care. I was like, you know what, this is just apparently who I am and apparently I'm not good enough for God. Like, and I'm stuck. And so this conversation with, between him and I would go on for about a month and then he was like, so, send me pictures. And like when he says pictures, he means like pictures, okay? Not like the like pictures. <laughs> and I got up locked my dorm room door, prayed to heaven on high, my roommate would not walk back in and gave him his pictures. And for the first time, I completely just was like, this is who I am. And like, I don't have a choice. Like, I'm stuck. And I felt like my only hope was just to give in. And I began to think about what it would take to get out to California and I guess like try to find somebody that could put me in the industry and just get this misery over with. And I could just tell the whole world that I'm apparently some freak of nature and be done with it and everyone would know the truth and I could be over this. And I was 17 at that point. So I'm 17 and becoming someone else's pornography and then thinking about going into the industry and I'm a Christian. Like how does that work? You know, I love God and I wanted to be close to him and I wanted him to love me. I wanted that. But it was like I, I was stuck. I couldn't break free from this. And so God in his sovereignty took me away from that school and I went home for um, about nine months and in those nine months I didn't have, um, I had broad, no, not broadband, I had dial-up <laughs> and so you can send pictures over dial-up in case anyone doesn't know and so that kind of that relationship started to die off and God started to really work in my life to kind of make himself present and to kind of show me that he was still there, you know, that he hadn't, I had completely given up on myself but he wasn't giving up on me and one of my friends died in a missionary accident. She was traveling with a singing group and they got plastered by this semi and the van went up in flames and they were gone. And the only thing that made it out was her Bible, completely untouched, and a CD still in the shrink wrap from the store, the very multiple shrink wrap from the store. And the title of the CD was God Makes No Mistakes. And I sat in that memorial service and I was like, God didn't mess up. Like, he didn't save the wrong girl. Like, somewhere there's got to be hope for me. Like, he doesn't make mistakes. And so I began to really want to long after God and want to follow him and kind of was trying to ignore the fact that I was struggling with pornography and, like, work around it. And so I went out to Bible college, and it was at Bible college that we had this meeting. And now at Bible college, you meet, like, four different kind of people. You have, like, I don't know if you guys have Bible colleges. Catholics, do you? Okay. Okay. So you'll meet four different kind of people. You meet, like, the complete juvenile delinquents that their parents are just so tired of dealing with them that they just ship them off to college, you know? And they're like, if you don't get your life right, you're going to jail. <laughs> so you meet those guys, and you stay away from those guys. And then you meet, like, we have, like, preacher's kids, missionary kids that totally live their parents' faith and are so faithful that it drives you nuts and then you have people like me who really have no clue why they're there and really are so broken and just feel a little defective and then you have Christian Barbie you know you know what I'm talking about they're like oh I'm so happy that God made you my roommate and like we're just gonna have such a great year glorifying God and you're like shut up <laughs> what is wrong with you and you hate them but at the same time you like like them, you know, because you're like, wow, God's maybe real to them, I'm not really sure, <laughs> but you want that joy, 
and that freedom and like that overflowing vibrant love for God you can't stand them but you're like maybe if I could have like a little bit of the Barbie <laughs> maybe the hair and that's good and so you meet those kinds of people we had this meeting and so imagine sitting in this meeting with Christian Barbie beside you and hearing some of you struggle with pornography and masturbation well you know exactly who Christian Barbie is thinking well it's not me it must be her like her the juvenile delinquent sitting behind us and so I'm sitting in that meeting and she's talking about strongholds and I had wanted so much to be that joyful, vibrant Christian, but I was so angry just with people and just with the, where my life was. And it's funny how whatever you are internally spills out. And it's like, I would get really angry at people for no apparent reason. I'm sure they felt like I was really hormonal, but I was having internal issues. And so they were spilling out. And I would just get so frustrated with Christian Barbie because I'm like, why? <laughs> why are you so perfect? And then in this meeting, she's talking, the dean is talking about how we can't grow close to Christ because of strongholds. And like, I'm leaning forward in my seat because she hasn't dropped the bomb yet. I'm leaning forward in my seat like, oh, this is the answer. It's got to be reading the Bible. It's got to be praying more. Like, it's, I'm leaning forward because she's telling, she's talking about me. Like, she's telling me what I'm going through. And then she drops this bomb that some of you are struggling with pornography and masturbation. And it was like a big old light bulb because I hadn't thought of it. I'd been there for three months at that point, And we had this internet access that was like strictly monitored, like filtered. Like you couldn't even get to the sites if you wanted to. On top of that, you couldn't have your own computer. And then in the library, all of the computers faced out. So you'd be really, really stupid like, to get on a bad site because they all faced the center of the room. So there was no chance for that. And then I had three roommates to try to sneak around. And all three of them had identical class schedules as mine. So that means we were all at the room at the same time. So God had really protected me in that time. And I kind of walked right by pornography in my life. And I was moving on to... Um, you know, Bible reading and prayer. And like, I had completely ignored this fortress that was behind me. And like, anytime I would go somewhere or want to like really get into the Word of God, it felt like I was just reading a storybook. You know, or when I'm praying, like, have you ever, maybe not, have you ever felt like your prayers like bounced off the ceiling and like came right back down and snatched you in the back of the head? Like, they're not going anywhere. And I'd be like, why? I want this. Like, I really want this. I really want God in a very tangible way. What seems to be the problem here? I'll read my Bible more. Because those are the things that I was dealing with here. I hadn't even thought about what was behind me. And so she drops this bond, and then she follows it up by saying, now, you're going to write down your stronghold. I was like, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> you can try that again. I'm an American. I'm going to get up and walk out of this room, and you can't stop me. <laughs> and I remember looking up at her, and I was so, I thought I had killed my pride back at this memorial service, you know, and surrendered my life to God and said, hey, God, whatever. Like, I know you didn't mess up. Like, this is me. This is my desires, and I'm going to sacrifice them. But, buddy, it came back that night, and it was like, you don't have to tell them anything. You can totally take care of this on your own. Like, you don't need them. You don't need to do this. Put down Bible reading. He's <laughs> like, Put down, read more Christian books this year. Like, put down something else. You don't have to put this down. But it was like God was standing right behind me saying, hello. Like, how much more of a conversation starter were you looking for exactly? Because I dropped it for you, and then right behind it, I put a little slip of paper that says, my name is blank, and my stronghold is blank. You've only got a few things to fill in here. And I already gave you your answer. So I began to really struggle. And, like, I was getting mad. Because it's not this. Why did I have to be the slip? But as they're going through their slips, they stop and go, oh, whew, oh, we're going to put that one over there. Why did I get to be that girl? And I got so angry with God. But it was like he was standing right there saying, please, I don't make mistakes. You've got to trust me. And so I wrote it out. And it's 11 letters. And it felt like I was writing a freaking book. Okay? <laughs> I had to write it out twice. And it was the first time I had ever seen it in writing. I, Jessica Harris... My stronghold is pornography. And I was like, wow, that's rough. And so I balled up those little slips. They were little slips of paper, and I rolled them up <laughs> really tiny. <laughs> and if I could have like put them in a straw and spit them at the women I was supposed to give them to, I would have done that. But I had this little slip of paper, and I kind of walked up to them, you know, like, read this later. <laughs> so, and then I kind of slipped out of the meeting. I didn't want to stay. And I felt... As I was walking back to my dorm, I felt so defeated. And that's why this is my little, my little, you guys know what this is, right? It's a ball and chain. We'll see if it stays on. I'm a teacher in my spare time. 
of high schoolers, but it looks like I'm an elementary school teacher right now. <laughs> All right. So I've got my little ball and chain, right? Sweet. <laughs> you like that? And so, um, where's my marker? And so I identified, this is kind of fun. This is what the strongholds do. They inhibit your walk with Christ, just like this, yes. And so I had identified my stronghold, right? And of course, like in this, you have to understand that pornography is like the worst, um, maybe not the worst, but the, what do I say? Like the highest manifestation of lust. Like my problem wasn't pornography, obviously. It was lust. And so like I have all of these other things, like lust and like a distorted, distorted view of love. This is my chain. This is my thing that's keeping me back from Christ. And so I'm going back to my dorm room, and it seriously felt like I was dragging this with me. And like Satan was right behind me saying, oh, you've done it now, girl. You are going home, and this is it. Like, you're not making it out of here. Like, you're going home. You screwed up. You're mine. You belong to me. Remember, God doesn't love you. And the whole way back, I'm just like... I'm going, like, this is it. Like, this is my breaking point. And if this doesn't work, I've confessed. Like, what more? I've been caught, and it didn't work. I'm confessing, and it didn't work. Like, (laughs) there's nothing else to do. Like, there's no other option. And I got back to my room, and I was alone, and I was just in tears. And I said, God, this has to work. If they lied to me, if they didn't tell me the truth, if this is wrong, I'm scared. Because I don't know what's going to happen next. Like, I almost fell into the adult industry when I got caught. If I've confessed and am ignored, what's going to happen to me? Like, and if they send me home, what am I supposed to do? And I was like, you've got to help me. Like, and it felt like he wasn't there. And it felt like in those moments, I almost felt like I was experiencing what Christ must have felt when he was like, why have you forsaken me? Like, that's how I felt. And I was like, but you told me to write this down. Why aren't you listening to me now? Like, why aren't, why am I not hearing you? Why don't I feel you here now? Why is the only thing I'm feeling Satan accusing the brethren, just beating the crap out of me? Why are you letting this happen? And so I laid in my room for a while, crying into my pillow like every good Christian girl does. <laughs> and, um, one of the, my accountability partners, you guys know what accountability partners are? My, one of my roommates didn't. Do you guys understand? Like I told someone else and they're supposed to help keep me accountable. Um, no? Um, okay, so we Pente- oh, Pentecostals. I'm not Pentecostal. <laughs> Just so everyone knows. I'm Protestant. <laughs> I'm a Baptist. Um, when we have an issue in our life as, as severe as a sin that's like an addictive sin, we go to someone else and we would say, Natalie, I struggle with pornography, and I know that's like really hard for you to, to take, but I want you to keep me accountable. So like when you see me, I want you to ask me, so how's your walk? So have you fallen to pornography? To keep me, to make me know that I have someone who knows it's not a secret anymore, and I have to answer. Like, like it's a really close friendship that we have, and I didn't realize that like other, <laughs> other people don't do that, sorry. And um, But she came to the door, and she had the power to kick me out of school. She was higher up in the in the school rankings and I thought oh here it is and so I walked out into the hallway and like I wanted to stop her and like talk first and be like please don't send me home like you don't understand like I every single lie was gone because she said we're gonna help you and one of the things she said was Jessica you run to grace and you keep on running because so often we want to like fight we want to throw our little pebbles at St. Joseph's Oratory. If you want to take out St. Joseph's Oratory, you're going to need like a tank. Okay? <laughs> and I didn't have one. And God's like, I've got the tank. So you get out of the way so I don't take you out. Well, I'm taking that out. And just run to me. And that's what she was telling me. And it was, I'm still walking around with this chain. I have a purpose. Trust me. It, it, it works. So she's telling me to run to grace and to keep on running. And can I tell you that it didn't happen right away? Like it wasn't like the next day I'm like, oh, I'm free. And I never fell again. Like that's not how this works. For women, lust starts in our hearts. It, that's where it starts. And everyone's like, ooh, that's in our notes. <laughs> lust starts inside us. For men, lust starts with their eyes. And so we're switched. Because a woman may not struggle with pornography, but she can still struggle with lust. You know, And they usually struggle with lust first. And remember that lust is just a twisted view of love. 
and then we look for love in men. And so then that turns into sex, and so that turns into all different kinds of manifestations, but it's a heart issue. And so God's going to go there first, and he's going there first, and your body is still addicted. It's an addiction. It's a very scientifically proven chemical hormonal addiction in your body. It's like doing drugs. Your body releases dopamine when you're sexually whatever. And God wanted it to be that way because for a husband and wife, like that's perfect. That's what we need. We need wives to be addicted to their husbands. That's great. But <laughs> when you don't have one to be addicted to, you have a problem. Like when there's no love to be addicted to, then we're having issues here. And so it took me probably about a year and a half to get to the point where I was physically free from lust. And I walked back onto campus, and my dean of women looked at me and said, Jessica, you're a Christian Barbie today. <laughs> like, she could, she's like, you don't even have to tell me, I already know. And like, she's like, you could see the joy from having a full and complete, untouched relationship with God. She's like, we can tell you made it through the break. And I was like, you have no idea, like, I totally made it. And they're like, just keep running to grace. And so for the past probably five years maybe, Four, I've been running into grace. And what's cool about grace is it doesn't end. And like you run into it and it keeps going. Like you're like, okay, it's like running on the back of like a treadmill going the wrong way. You know, like, okay. <laughs> Anytime you want to like stop. And God just keeps pouring out grace on us. You know, and your your bishops and your speakers have been saying that. Like we have to grow into it. Like it's so big for us. And we have to kind of grow into this thing. It's bigger than we are. And we're always learning something new about it. And like so grace, it freed me from my sin, but then the cool thing was it went all the way back and it like washed over my past and like healed my father leaving my family, you know, healed my dad taking my little heart and like driving it halfway across the world and healed the pain caused by the, the boy on the bus, like healed all of that. So then there's not even, so my heart is made whole, like it's not still longing, like I've learned to find my contentment in Christ. And that's how you uh, really eliminate lust, is to just find your contentment in Christ. If you look to him as your lover, then there's no distorted view of love. Like, you can't get more perfect love than God's love. Like, that's what he is. So, but I also learned that grace heals our future. Like, it heals us from the consequences that we put on ourselves, I guess I should say. Because, um, like, we're always beating ourselves up, especially as women, like, oh, I'm not pretty enough, or oh, she doesn't like me, or oh, why am I, why don't I have hair like her, and I'm ugly, and I shouldn't have done that, and I'm stupid, and we're always beating ourselves up. And that's why Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, you know, because he's standing there helping you out. Like, you can't live for God. Like, what is that? Like, <laughs> you were a porn addict. Good luck with that one, you know. Did you not forget? And so... I learned probably in the last three months, like this is how much of a process this is. Three months ago, I was at a friend's house with him and his wife, and I had like given them like a pie or whatever. Do you call them pies? Not, it's not a pizza, it's like the dessert pie. Okay. <laughs> and I had given them a pie like the night before, and he had sent me an email, just to thank you for the pie, we're so glad you're part of our lives, the end. <laughs> well, they like that's great. You know, moving on, like it wasn't like scandalous. It wasn't a scandalous email. Like I really like to meet you for lunch tomorrow. Like I wasn't. I was like, oh, that's nice. Next email, and so I went over to their house the next night, and he goes, "By the way, my wife is completely fine with the email you sent me." What is that supposed to mean? Well, of course she's fine with the email I sent you. Like it was, or you sent me. Like it's just thank you. Like who's that's stupid? And it felt like he was judging me because they know they know my past, and it felt like he was viewing me through my past and it felt like he was saying you know you better just like stay back from our marriage because don't you even try anything with me like my wife's in on it now we're both You're like we got you we're watching you <laughs> and that's what i felt like and i was so broken because i had trusted that to them and i felt like they turned it around and were using it against me they were judging me for it and so i kind of was like oh bye and i drove back to my house and cried into my pillow like a good christian girl does and i i cried out to god and i said this can't be freedom like this can't be what Calvary gives us to have to constantly know we're not addicted to a sin anymore but to constantly kind of like drag the chain and to live in its shadow and know it's not holding us back but like I'm not going to walk out into the conference like this and not get looked at hello like if I leave this on people are going to be like okay <laughs> and but that's how it is for us like we walk around 
and we're still holding on to the sin. Do I have to have this on? No. Like, I could have totally taken it off when I popped the balloon. But we hold on to the lies, you know, that we're never going to be good enough, that God's never going to really love us, that we can't have a normal life. And in that night when I was crying out to God, I was like, this can't be freedom. And it's like he came down and he said, it's not. You're holding on to it yourself. You, he didn't mean it that way. You were filtering it that way. He, and I, so I, I texted, yeah, yay for texting. And I texted him and I said, I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. And I was kind of mad, you know, at him because good Christian girls do that. And so I'm, I'm angry with him, but we got to talking and he, I went over to our house and he gave me a big hug. And he says, I am so sorry. Like, I never meant to hurt you. He's like, we have completely, we don't care where you've been. Like, it doesn't matter. And I realize that grace promises us when it works in our heart and it frees us from sin, it frees us and helps us to forgive others, that after that it promises that we're free and that we have life. And so we don't have this little chain anymore. You know, we're, we're done. And, like, I can go out to the conference completely normal now without things hanging off my legs. Like, I can go through life because grace promises that to me. It promises me freedom. But for so many young women, and like obviously mine is it's not an extreme case. I shouldn't say that. Because about 20% um, of Christian women actually struggle with pornography. Um, they haven't even done statistics on masturbation or anything like that. They haven't gotten that far. Um, we think that we're very much alone, you know? And it's like, oh, I'm the only person. And God wants to reach out to us if we struggle with lust. And, like, it doesn't even have to be, like, lust, like a bad lust, you know? But sometimes we daydream about guys. You know, when I was at college, they'd walk by me, and, buddy, I had them sized for a tux, you know? <laughs> like, you have your little wedding dress pictured in your head, and you have, like, the whole, you've got your whole bridal party picked out, and you've got, like, all these headless men <laughs> on this side. And, like, they walk by, and you're like, nope, too short. No, oh, no, he's, no, that's not going to work. No, he needs to shave. He needs brown eyes. He needs blue eyes. Like, he needs to work out more. <laughs> and even that can be a type of lust for us. Because we're not being drawn to Christ, and we're not surrendering that to Christ. We're still kind of trying to take our sexuality or our love out of God's control, and we're not surrendering that to Him. And lust is a killer. Like, it starts in your hearts. And so if you meet a woman who's struggling with pornography, she's been hurting a long time. And, like, people are, can be so judgmental because they're like, oh, you're sick. And you hear that all the time when they're talking about pornography. The men are sick, and so no one thinks that women could be that sick. But we're broken. Like, if you meet a woman who's struggling with lust, there was hurt. Her heart was searching, and it found it here. Because the devil knows that that's so much part of who we are. And he knows that he can get our sexuality that, like, he doesn't need to worry about anything else. Like, go ahead, read your Bible. Go ahead and pray. But at the core of who you are, I've got you. It doesn't matter. And so it's a stronghold for us. And so we're going to go ahead and go through these little booklets. Yay! I didn't quite do them all. But so we'll do these, and then we're going to do like a little um, question and answer thing. So, oh, we had like a lot more people because everyone's like, I'm coming. I said, sneak in the back. So those aren't the people I told to sneak in the back, which means that someone I told to sneak in the back took a seat. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to look at these. Um, I started a ministry in 2009 called Beggar's Daughter for Women Struggling with Pornography, basically. But um, it's really for women struggling with all kinds of lust because if you struggle with pornography, you struggle with all the lust, you know. So um, all these are folded. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's look at this real quick. This is a quote from one of my friends, actually, I went to college with. The quote down the side is a, a quote from one of the friends I went to college with. And um, I didn't know. Like, she was struggling. We were really close friends, and I had no complete idea. For that matter, two of my roommates were also struggling, and I didn't know until after we had graduated from college. Like, that's how common this is. And so this is what she said. Something that has always bothered me is that so often pornography is associated with men, but not so much with women. I will even tell you that today, as I have told people, I'm speaking on lust. I have gotten, like, the men are like, eh? Like, and, uh... One of the men, I'm not going to, you guys know who he is, so I'm not going to shame him like that. But he walked in and he said, 
do women really have this problem? Like, really? And I went, yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, why? You know, he didn't, it doesn't understand men are idiots, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they, they are very visual, right? And so, like, all of their resources say, well, guys will be guys, we're visual learners, blah, 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 blah. You take away the visual and you'll get rid of the sin, like, whatever. We're not visual. Women are not attracted to pornography for visual reasons, okay? And so you can take away the pornography, but it doesn't stop that there's lust in our hearts. It doesn't stop that we're still dealing with stuff inside. So this leaves us women feeling as though we are the only one who struggles with this, that no one would understand hopeless. That is a lie from Satan, though. She has never heard this talk, by the way. <laughs> Many women struggle with it. It is not uncommon. I struggled with it for 10 years and didn't tell anyone for a long time because I thought no one would understand. So I don't know. I'm not like saying that because you came to the lust session that you all are struggling with lust. Like, that's not why you're here. Okay. Some of you came because you're just like, whatever, I always go to the women's only session. And so you're here and you had no idea what was going to hit you when you walked in the door. Others of you came because you knew what it was and were like, it's about time. For whatever reason, either you are there or you know someone who is there. Or you're just like, I want to be able to help. You guys are being called to be missionaries and to go out. You're going to meet these women. And you're going to try to evangelize them. And they're going to say, you know what? God can never love me for what I've done. You don't know what I've done. And you can say, you know what? I don't. But I'm pretty sure that he can reach you no matter where you are. Like, I'm pretty sure that he gets that far. But there are some groups, and it's not Catholics and it's not mine either, um, that believe that pornography is a sin worse than the sin of Adam, so in that it's not forgivable by the blood of the cross. And that would be wrong, just in case anyone was confused. That would be wrong. Um, it's very forgivable, and it's just, a, it's just a heart that's wandered away from God, and it's just pulling that heart back to him. And so a stronghold is an enemy's fortress behind your own front lines. Whatever you have to... Do you guys need pens? Unless you have really good memories. Does anyone else need a pen? Do you need a book? No. Let's see if I can put a few more. Oh, maybe I don't. Where'd they go? Who did they... Yeah, behind your own front lines. Yeah. I thought I did. I don't know where they all went. I have like a whole pack that just like fell over. But you guys can always have the one I have in my hand. Oh, look, there they are. Is it the only one? Is there only one? Oh, you know what? There's a copy machine in the CCO office. I would leave, but that's kind of rude. <laughs> What? I know. She gave me some people that were standing over there. Okay. Come back. Oh, we're doing pens. We're good? All right, everyone have pens, everyone have paper, good. All right, so the second one, lust is a stronghold built on sin. It's a legitimate sin, okay? But it's strengthened by lies. They chain you to it. They tell you you can't be free, okay? So we have these lies. You can never be free. Hang on, I don't know some of these. <laughs> Let me get my, my cheat sheet. Wait for it. You can never be free. You are alone. You belong to me. That's the devil. The devil will tell you that. No one will ever want you. A lot of single women struggle with this because they feel like they can never be married after they've dealt with lust. And number five, you will never be normal. Those are lies we believe. And they keep us chained to lust. Over here, you have victory and freedom. Victory is the defeat of sin. 
This is like the whole taking down the, the, the castle. This was done at the cross. Like, you don't have to do this. The assault on the castle isn't yours. God's got the tank, you know. <laughs> he's got it, and he's ready. And that's his battle to fight. And sometimes we feel like we have to fight. We have to break free. We have to do this, and he's already done it for us. See, it is a truth. It's a reality that we know as Christians that the cross covers all and that it defeated sin. It conquered sin. But freedom is different from victory. Victory is something that you achieve, like you fight for and da-da-da-da. You're victorious. In the next match, you might lose. But freedom is different. Freedom is the denial of sin. It's what we do. Okay? It's found through walking in the Spirit. And freedom is a choice. It's you choosing to live in the victory provided by Calvary. That's what it is. And so you don't have to fight. It's a little quote on the bottom. You don't have to fight. All you have to do is simply run. And this is like flee temptation. You know, flee useful lusts. But you run to God. Sometimes you just like run around in circles like, ah! don't get me but like if someone's chasing you when you're little it's a lot smarter to run to dad or mom you know because they'll like tell them to stop than it is to just like run and to run around and so we flee this we flee youthful us we flee temptation but we flee to god and trust him to kind of fight the battle for us at the bottom is another quote from another young woman i've dealt with on the back which one the second one found at the cross. All right, and on the back you have walking in freedom. And for us, lust begins in our mind or our heart. And after that, it can spread. For someone, it never does. Some women, it's just a heart issue. Like, it never turns into a physical manifestation of lust. Like, it's just a heart or a thought issue. So it can spread. Freedom also begins in your mind. It's saying to this, I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do this. And after that, freedom will spread. It will take over your heart, your mind, your body, your actions, your thoughts, your words. It will completely wash over you. Our battle is not physical. It's not about you, like, breaking bad habits and conquering your lust and, like, 12-step programs and whatever. It's a spiritual battle. This is about the kingdom of grace being assaulted by the kingdom that opposes grace. This is about God's love being distorted by the powers of hell. That's what this is. And so for us, we must take every thought captive to Christ. And when I was doing, I did a little run through last night for some women who were like really, really mad that they couldn't get in the door here. So I did like a little pre-talk. And one of them asked me like, what do you do? Like, do you still struggle? And like, yeah. Like, it, I'm not stupid enough to walk around like, doo, 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 doo. like I'm never going to struggle again. Like, that's stupid. Once you struggle with something, it's a weakness for you. Like, and you have to be aware of it. You don't have to, like, beat yourself up for it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if someone's an alcoholic, it's not wise for them to go back to the bar and take just one more drink. You know, that's all it's ever been for them. Just one more drink. Just one more drink. So it's not wise for them to go back and start over again. So for me, there are certain situations that are not wise. There are certain things that bring up patterns from before. And this is where every thought captive to Christ comes in. Imagine you are in your own home and someone breaks in. Okay? Are you going to be like, oh, well, you know, there's a TV over there. My laptop's upstairs. And I have $100 hidden in a book. So go for it. Like, I'm cool. I'm making dinner. Just don't interrupt me. Like, that's how we're taught to deal with it sometimes. Like, oh, just ignore those thoughts. Like, it's not a big deal. Just, you know, Philippians 4, I don't remember, bad Baptist. Um, Philippians 4, whatever. Like, 
think on these things, you know, like, well, think on this, think on this. Ignore the fact that you're thinking about something else. Just think on, on this, you know. Just ignore the bad guy running around your house behind you and focus on making dinner. Or we're taught to, like, stand at the door with a shotgun, you know, and do absolutely nothing else with our life but stand at the door with a shotgun, and you're not going to get in here. Like, you're not going to come in. And, like, we're not effective if all we're ever doing is thinking about not sinning. You know, like, I shall not sin, I shall not sin, I shall not sin, I shall not sin, I shall not follow pornography, I shall not follow pornography. You're giving it more room in your life than it deserves when you do that. And so every thought captive says, when that thought busts into my temple, to my body that is supposed to be for Christ, heart, body, mind, soul, everything is supposed to be for Christ, when that thought busts through a window, I go over, not literally, and <laughs> grab it by its neck and like drag it before God and say, here, look who broke into your house. Ha huh? like, you're so busted. <laughs> That's what we do. Like, it's not just like, oh, well, I shouldn't be thinking about that. Oh, switch channels. It's more of a, why did that just happen? How did they get in? How did that happen? What just happened that brought that up? Was I looking at a guy? Was I spending too much time with a guy? Did someone say something? Did I read something? Did I watch something? What allowed that to get in here? And you take it to God, and God deals with it, trust me. And then he helps you to kind of build up and fortify those things. Okay, so that's how we deal with lust. We have to start in our minds. Um, and the bottom we'll do at the end. But this is your time for questions and answers. And Christy is going to, like, intercede for me, like, it's between you and me. So... Oh, look, there's already one. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick question. Uh -huh. So, shortly, it's just like whenever you think that you have some evil thinking, you're going to pray. Yeah. For, for me, it's very much of, it's not like, oh, I'm going to write that down and think about it later, like, <laughs> come back to God with it later, but like, um, I was telling some of my friends, I've been spending a lot of time with Matt and Todd. They're good friends. Matt's a really good friend. He's a ministry partner of mine, actually. And I would never have done that three years ago because I was too weak. And like spending time with a guy, like, oh, I think he likes me. You know how we do that, right? Oh, he said hi. Oh, he knows my name. <laughs> and our minds just go. <laughs> and so it's learning to develop um, the habit of focusing on truth. And like when that like little thing pops up in the window, to be like, oh, no, you're not getting in here. But it is a matter of prayer. Like, if an impure thought were to come into my mind about either one of those men or anybody that I'm with here, then it would be something immediately that I, I would almost drop whatever I was doing and be like, I need to go for just a minute and just pray because it's a current issue. And if you let it do its damage, then you're kind of reversing your freedom, you know? Like, you let it wander around and then... You know, we forget about it. We're like, oh, well, it's no big deal. Like, I'm not thinking about it anymore. And, like, I know it's not like that. But the thought was there. And we have to deal with that. Chirp, chirp. Yes. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you are very welcome. Just shed light to a topic that a lot of us maybe haven't had so much experience with. But um, the question that I had is, can you just shed more light into, um, you said that, for some women, it just remains a heart issue. It doesn't manifest itself into physical mm -hmm. um, manifestation, because I think that some of us may be in that position. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just shed light into that? Like, what are some yeah. other things that you found that how do we deal with that when it hasn't manifested itself into pornography, but there's still those the thought. thoughts? Mm -hmm. and, like, for example, I noticed in the paragraph that said romance novels or Right. Like that. Oh, right. That's um. Which I don't know if you guys can hear because she's up in the front. Her question is: she wants me to like, like explain more about the um, when it only is a heart and mind issue, when it's not like physically manifesting itself. Like, what do you do? How does it manifest itself? What is that like? How what's that look like when it's not like pornography? Obviously, we're like bad. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> masturbation should have a big no over it. Unfortunately, some people are like, oh, it's only natural and whatever. But um, this is how I like to look at it. Um, there is this problem. It's called soft core pornography. I don't know if you guys know that. Romance novels, bridal magazines with half-naked men in them and women standing in front of what's important so you can't see it. Um, uh, like chick flicks with like the bed scenes, those are purposefully designed for you, for women. Like, they're not designed for men. No man picks up a bridal magazine, you know. He's not like, ooh, look, rides. Like, <laughs> that's not how this works. They're designed for you, and that's interesting to see because they're after your heart. Think about it. That's chick flicks. 
that these things are in. That's bridal magazines that these things are in. Okay, that's novels, romance novels that these things are in. And you get all caught up with your heart in the story, and then it immediately connects you to sex. And so it like takes love and it flips right in. And now obviously there's like a natural progression there, but they don't do it the right way ever. Okay, ever. Um, so I think it's important to really regard sex as sacred. And like that's how I like to look at it. It's a, it's a sacred thing. And so I define pornography as this. Pornography is anything that assaults the holiness of God by downplaying the sacredness of sex. That's pornography. So like a bunch more stuff than just like the websites gets lumped into that because anything that says that downplays what God thinks of sex is really pornography. We just don't call it that, but that's what it is. And so like even if your mind in your mind there is this thought of oh, he's really cute. Why did you think that? Like was it a physical like oh, he's hot. I want to ask him out. Like was it that process cuz then that's a physical thing. You don't know him. And like pornography detaches you from people. You don't know those people. Like men especially, they don't know those women. You know, like there's a sex bar like right down the road here that we walk by and it totally like <laughs> I live in liberal Washington DC and we don't even have those. And I walked by and I was like, holy moly. Like those guys going there don't know those women from Eve. You know? They're just like, they're a woman. It's a body. I don't care if she has kids. I don't care what her favorite color is. I don't care what her favorite music is. All I care is that she's a body. And so when we start doing the same thing to men, detaching ourselves from who they are, like, personally and spiritually, like, the person of who they are and are only focused on their body, then we are committing in some weakened state of form of pornography. Like, we are detaching them and only looking at the physical and lusting after that. So, yes, do you still have a question? Oh yeah, it's called women's porn actually. That's what it's called in the industry. In the adult industry, those things are actually called women's porn. Um, they obviously don't like put that across the front because then we wouldn't <laughs> look at it. But it's called softcore pornography or women's porn. It's designed especially for women to draw them in. Anybody else? You don't have to be embarrassed. I think I've said every bad word possible. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you for me personally, and this is like my own personal standard, I'm not going to tell you all that you have to do this. I don't watch movies now because honestly, good luck finding a movie that doesn't have somebody half naked, somebody rolling around in bed, somebody whatever. And so I don't, but my brothers do watch movies and like Transformers is a really raunchy movie, okay? Like I had no, I thought this is a man movie, like there's no chickiness in this movie, like it's big metal robots and like there's a lot of sex and like crude humor in that movie and like women changing in a car and like you're watching them change in the car you know and my brothers are so great because they both want to respect the purity of women you know and so like they like the manly like metalness of these movies but like this the the sex part just absolutely drives them nuts because they don't think that way so if something like that comes up both of my brothers will actually turn like, we'll, if you're watching a movie with them, they will physically turn away until it sounds like Optimus Prime is back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll actually turn. And I think when I am, like, watching something neutral, like NCIS or whatever, like, my sister's, a, like, a forensic freak. And so if I want bonding time with her, I have to watch NCIS because I don't see her otherwise. So, and sometimes, like, in the middle of a crime show, all of a sudden, like, they're at a strip bar. Like, why do they go to, like, what? 
I don't understand why it's, well, I do, but, like, it's frustrating that it's in everything. And it is just one of those things where we're either change the channels or we, like, start having conversation and just let that go until it's back to crime solving and not a sex bar. So I think it's just, it's a matter of every thought. And, like, if this movie, if you're being drawn into the sex scene in this movie, like, your brain doesn't belong there. Your thoughts don't belong there. Like, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is pure. Like, that's what you're supposed to be thinking on. And so if the movie is, like, drawing you into that, then like, I, I, I don't watch them, you know, for that very reason. Like, there's just too much. And so I don't. And I know it makes me weird, but <laughs> that's the standard that I drew for myself because... I know I'm so weak, and so I won't look at bridal magazines for that reason. And when I was first coming out of pornography, my roommates in college were so great. They were reading like a Christian romance novel, and Christian romance novels are so great because like they don't have like the sex scene in it. Like you know it happened, but like it's between a husband and a wife, and like it just like the next morning they're out doing whatever. Like, and it's, like, you know, but it's not you're not there. Do you know what I'm saying? And so. Um, but they would be talking about like how they couldn't wait, and it was very exciting and like hopefully anticipation. And but I said, could you guys please not? And like you're not doing anything wrong. Like you really aren't. You are glorifying it. You are honoring it. And I'm sure God is just so happy that you have this healthy mindset. But you gotta shut up for me because this is too much. Like even discussing it in the godly context at first was too much. Like I couldn't do this. This wouldn't have happened. Um, and. So I think after time, you kind of understand where your real boundaries are because you, like, you protect wide at first to really protect that weakness. And then as you get stronger, you can kind of bring it in, but you never drop them. Like, they're never gone. And so for me, I don't watch them. Someone else might just be like, perfectly fine and might think the whole time, oh, this is so gross. Why do they put these in movies? But for me, it would be way too dangerous. So I think it's like a personal, un like, between you and God understanding of what, he wants you to be thinking on. Yes. Yes. Actually, I have an, an email I'm going to read to you guys from one of the women. She's 27 years old and has been involved in pornography. And a lot of women think when I get married, it'll be done. You know, they think then I'll have like the real thing and I won't be worried about this anymore. She was sexually involved when she was younger, and I'll actually read it to you. She was sexually involved when she was younger, had like five boyfriends in college and had sex with all of them, like one of those kinds of people, and then stopped doing that, got a, a, a guy, and they committed to wait until they were married, like a second virginity kind of thing, and um, but then she went over to overseas and like was on a student internship and had sex with some guy over there while she's engaged to the guy she's not having sex with until she's married. and. Um, and now she wrote to me and she said it was so heartbreaking to realize that I didn't love my husband. Like, when he wants to be intimate with me, I hate him. Like, I can't stand him. And she says, and the only way I can be intimate with him is to go into the other room, say, hang on, honey, I'm going to get ready, you know, and go into the other room, watch a porn video, and then come back and pretend that I'm in that video. Like, she's completely disconnected from him. And that's just that heart kind of manifesting itself that... I can't be loved, like you can't really love me, like I can't have a normal, healthy relationship. And so yeah, it does carry over, like I don't know how I'm not married and I haven't had to deal with that and it scares the crap out of me that I might have to deal with that someday, like I really don't know how it's going to work, I haven't been there, you know, and, but it's something that, you know, trust to God that if His grace is enough for everything that it's covered so far, it's going to be enough for that, but it does follow them. Okay. Anybody? Yes. Uh, I remember it. you mentioned one thing like uh, I think that virginity and purity. Mm -hmm. You said that there is the difference between the two. Right. Mm -hmm. you have like explain yeah. a little bit about it? Um, this is the way I teach it. And, like I have a workshop that's called Why Purity Rings Don't Work. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I teach it like this, the world does abstinence, okay? Like, there is no difference between the church and the world. You can scare somebody into being abstinent, all right? It's because all of our lives, and it's actually a holiness. It's how we come before God. It's our, it's, it's part of our worship. And so, like, it encompasses everything. It encompasses our minds. It encompasses this, because it says, um, who can come before God? In the Psalms, it says, who can come before God? He who has a pure heart. And so, purity is just this thing that totally 
overtakes your whole body and it's not in this little ring that says, haha, look, I'm going to be a virgin. Like, this isn't a purity ring, by the way. This is something different that I explained in that workshop that you're not going to get to hear. Sorry. And so, but it is a matter of surrendering that whole drive to God and saying, I'm not going to do this because I trust God to have worked it out the best way possible, you know? And like, he says husband and wife is the best way, so I'm going to believe him. And I'm going to wait for that. I want God's best for me. And when we have sex outside of marriage, we're basically saying, God, you don't know what's best for me. And we're saying, I want it now. And we're not willing to surrender. We're not willing to wait and allow him to bring the best. We're just concerned with what we want. And so abstinence, if you have an abstinent mindset, it runs the risk of this is all that matters. And what I do in that class, I throw a little Lego on the floor. Right? This is actually part of my rebuilding Jerusalem too. But I throw a little Lego on the floor like that. And I go, don't cross that. Like, <laughs> that was hard, you know. And when, we're abs when we have an abstinence mindset, we draw this little line that says, thou shalt not have sex. That's it. There is a whole lot more space up here that I could scoot around. But when we have a pure mindset, we have these huge boulders of like, God's holiness and God's love and you can't cross those and so they kind of protect you really it's not keeping you back and saying no 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 no, you can't cross that line they protect you and keep you safe until you're married and are in God's will in that respect but that's kind of the difference absence just focuses on this and says thou shalt not have sex but doesn't cover the whole thou shalt not lust thou shalt not covet you know all the other thou shalt's that we shalt not you know all of those things it doesn't deal with all of those it just it's very defined as I need to be a virgin when I'm married and it doesn't really matter whatever else I do because this is my line it's a very tiny line do you know what I'm saying so that's the difference between the two of them okay all right so you guys I'm going to break into small groups. I snuck balloons under your chair. You guys get to pop balloons. Don't do it yet. Okay. Um, I'm excited. So this is going to be tough for you, actually. And while you guys are, um, there are eight balloons and like a lot more than eight of you. So try to break into groups that are about the same size, like maybe eight to ten of you. I don't know if you just want to like partner the rows up and then I don't even know what you guys want to do. But there are balloons. There's two on the back row, I think. They're underneath the chairs. So look, and if you have a balloon, that means you're group leader. Ha ha. <laughs> 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 ha, ha. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to have you guys write down on this balloon. This is the time for you guys to be honest. You get to write down your strongholds. Okay. I'm not expecting every woman in this room to write down something with lust. I'm not. But if that's something you struggle with and you've been thinking, man, I'm so alone in this, this is your conversation starter. This is your chance. And what you're going to do is you're going to write down your stronghold. And it's not to be like, ha, oh, look at me. I have the worst sin on this balloon. Like, that's not the idea. But I want you guys to write it down and kind of say a prayer for each other. You know, lift each other up in prayer. Your sisters in Christ. Like, there's a lot going on here. You know, there's a lot of issues here. We have a lot of baggage, even as Christians. Like, we've got stuff. You know, and so even if it's just like a lie you're believing, even if it's not like, once upon a time, I did this. But if it's just like you really struggle with guilt or you really struggle with um, maybe your dad's, like something that really you have identified, man, this is holding me back. I want you to write it on the balloon and like put the balloon across your small group or whatever. And then the group leader, yay, gets to pop it. And <laughs> if you are afraid of popping balloons, now is the time to change group leaders. Okay. <laughs> Inside, please watch out. Wear your protective safety goggles because the balloon does have stuff inside of it that will fly. Um, but what is inside are promises of God. And we combat the lies of lust with the promises of God. So when Satan comes back into my life and says, you screwed up, I can turn around and say, God forgave me. Done. That link in that chain didn't even get a chance. Okay? And so these are promises of God. And they're all, there's like 12 different ones. So... Don't fight. <laughs> I want that promise, okay? They're for all of you. Um, but if there's one in there that just really speaks to you, I want you to take that and to kind of hold on to that. And so when the little thought creeps back in, it's not a sin for the devil to mess with you. 
And when he says, you know, you are totally messed up, God doesn't love you, you can pull it out. And there's one of them that says, God loves me unconditionally. Like, those are things you can kind of not allow that chain to form back, not allow your distorted view of God, which is really what lust is, down in the deepest parts, your distorted view of God to come back. Okay? And so while you're doing that, I'm going to play music. Yes, I am. But I'm going to read real quick. Hang on. Sorry. I'm not playing music, just real quick. I want you to see if you're, like, reflected in any of these women. These are all emails from women that have dealt with this. Um, recently, I haven't been able to control myself. I'm sorry, this is, like, halfway through. Um, I have been watching porn. I did this the whole of yesterday. This is a woman, by the way. Just before I sent this letter, I took a sneak peek into some porn. I am getting comfortable, and I don't like it. Most importantly, I know that it tears my relationship with God apart, and sometimes I feel too ashamed to even pray. I am lonely and lost, and I really want to go back to when I could control it, and I had a wonderful relationship with God. I had to see if I was the only one who defied God in this way, and I'm not alone. And then, I, am allowed, I have allowed my mind to become tainted, and I strayed from God to the point where I fell not into pornography, but masturbation during the midterm of 10th grade. I've been struggling ever since for the past year and a half. I felt shameful and guilty because I've tried everything and nothing seems to work. I fall into the same sins again. Purity is a process, not a journey. However, I feel seriously guilty because when I see girls who haven't viewed pornography or committed masturbation, I feel sad and envious because they'll never go through what I've gone through and they never have to face their future husbands in shame. I know I have hope and forgiveness in Christ, but it's hard for me not to think so negatively of myself. I feel so dirty and so unworthy. I wish I can go back and change everything. I wish that I didn't need to face my future husband with shame. Um, it seems like no matter how hard I fight or how much I hate the sin and so often myself, I still end up making the wrong choices. I made it through a few trips home, but then I fell right after I returned to school after fall break. I picked myself up again, asked forgiveness, went to confession, threw myself completely into my faith life, and things were good. I bought a purity ring, and I was so proud to be able to wear it with a clear conscience. I fell again today. Words cannot describe how disappointed in myself I am. I have asked for forgiveness and resolved to beat it so many times, but now part of me is just terrified that if I try again, I'll just fail. I feel like no one can help me and no one will understand. I have a group of girlfriends that know I've had this problem before. I swore to them that I would die before I fell back into the sick cycle. I meant it, I mean it. I hate this so much and I have no idea how to get out. I just can't keep doing this. It is destroying me. And this is the married woman. I had many boyfriends during my teenage years and I had sex with five of them. I met my husband when I was 20 years old and I made a pact with God and with him that we would not have sex before we were married. We didn't, but I did have sex with another guy when I was in Spain for two months and I was engaged to my husband. I am very blessed. She has two little boys. But I carry a lot of guilt, anger, and frustration and sadness within me. I know that Christ came to forgive me of all my sins and to set me free, but I am still struggling. And then these are three from the exact same woman over months. Um, I have been addicted to pornography and masturbation for over three years, and I feel like I will never be free from these chains. I currently attended a Bible college and have the facade of good Christian girl and the pillar of purity. Abstinence. But it is all a lie. I daily struggle with masturbation, and though I do not look at porn while I'm at school, I sex chat with men online. I cannot believe all the things I have done. This summer I even met with a married man with the intent of having sex. We didn't do anything, but the intention was there. I would have never dreamed of doing anything close to that three years ago. The path I am on is destroying my life. I have been on the verge of leaving my faith, my friends, and my family for sex for several months now. This is an addiction. Her next email. I have so many images and sounds and thoughts in my mind. It makes me sad that I have exposed myself to so much filth. And then, last Saturday, this is the next one. Last Saturday, I threw away every shred of innocence I had. So I don't know if you can see her spiral. I am still a virgin in the loosest physical sense, but I was with the man. I thought I would love it, that I would feel complete and beautiful and loved and satisfied. It was none of those things. It was awful. The most horrible experience of my life. Even while it was happening, I was crying tears of regret. I don't know what to do anymore. I keep throwing myself back into sin. I see the light of purity and a walk with Christ, but I feel as if it is unattainable now. I no longer just masturbate. I brought another person into it. I trampled on everything I know to be true and good. I cannot believe the girl I have become. I hate it. I hate this girl. 
I am empty. I feel almost spiritually dead. I feel as if trying is not even worth it anymore because God can't use what I have become. I'm numb to my sin. I really don't know what to do anymore. My sin is eaten away at my heart, and there is almost nothing left. So you can see in that last one how they just cycle down. So um, I'm going to play this, maybe, if I can see it. Oh, boy. Here we go. And I just want you guys to take the time to write and to, like, pray with each other and um, maybe. I'm so sorry. If I could just interrupt just for a few quick minutes. Or just, I, there's some people that are kind of making their way out. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to grab you guys before you're done. Uh, first of all, just want to thank Jessica so much.